when you think of extic- extinction what is what is the extinction of you say extinction of life so use life in a very metaphysical general category because life when you say extinction of life you're talking about an extinction of a form that doesn't exist because life exists in individual forms life exists as you life exists as me or as a fly or as a mosquito or something you have forms of life but on the other end you biologists routinely talk about continuity of life hello and welcome again to gulp log i'm antara chakraborty your host and today we meet again for another episode of bookmarked where we are going to discuss none other than professor dipesh chakraborty's recent book the climate of history in a planetary age published by chicago press and the indian edition by primus books before i go ahead to give a broad overview about the book i would like to introduce you all to our esteemed panelists that we have with us today we have with us our very first panelist professor sanjay seth professor of politics at goldsmiths university of london sanjay has published in the fields of modern indian history political and social theory post colonial theory and international relations he is particularly interested in how modern european ideologies and modern western knowledge more generally traveled to the non western world and what effects this had both on non western world and on modern western knowledge he often uses his indian archive to raise and pursue these broad social cultural and epistemological questions he is also the author of subject lessons the western education of colonial india our second panelist is professor shuti kapila professor of history at the university of cambridge associate professor associate As- professor professor <laughs> at the university of cambridge uh, professor kapila scholarship surrounds around modern and contemporary india and global political thought Her recent works focuses on 20th century political thought and theory and the Indian rewriting of modern political languages notably sovereignty democracy violence and republicanism. She is also an author of a forthcoming book Violent Fraternity Indian Political Thought in the Global Age. Talking about our author Professor Deepesh Chakraborty is a celebrated name in academia. We all have read his Provincializing Europe at some pub point of our lives being social science students he is a historian at the university of chicago he is currently the lawrence a kimpton distinguished service professor in history south asian languages and civilizations and the college he is the founding member of the editorial collective of subaltern studies a consulting editor of critical inquiry a founding editor of post colonial studies and has served on the editorial boards of american historical review and public culture Now coming to the book a very brief introduction to climate of history in a planetary age is divided across three parts and eight erudite and lucid chapters the book grapples with what this means and to confront humanity scholars with ideas they have been reluctant to consider from the changed nature of human agency to a new acceptance of universals the dichotomy between the human and the planet surrounding around anthropocene Professor Chakraborty argues that we must see ourselves from two perspectives at one the planetary and the global this distinction is central to his work he says that the globe is a human centric construction whereas the planetary perspective intentionally decenters the human featuring wide ranging excursions into historical and philosophical literatures the climate of history in the planetary age boldly considers how to frame the human condition in troubled times as we open ourselves to the implications of the anthropocene with this i would not like to take any more time and invite our first panelist professor sanjay seth and so please take us through your perusal of the book um, dipesh's article on the climate of history published in critical inquiry 12 years ago now had an electrifying effect on the world of scholarship a spate of subsequent articles explo- expanding on and developing some of the ideas signaled in this initial essay followed again with great effect and the book that was surely going to be the outcome of these diverse but linked inquiries was eagerly awaited it finally arrived a few months ago and it meets and even exceeds expectations the climate of history in a planetary age is quite simply a brilliant book and an important one It's therefore a great pleasure to be invited to discuss it with the author 
and with my colleague Shruti. Um, and in the time allotted, I'll try and mark out what some of the core arguments are on the presumption that many of the viewers will not yet have had a chance to read it, although I hope they will very soon. And also try and mark out one or two reasons why it's so exciting and important. And I'll end with a question for the Besh. Okay, the Besh's critical inquiry essay and this book are marked by an extraordinary and enviable knowledge of the scientific literature on climate change and associated issues. But it's addressed above all to scholars of the humanities and social sciences rather than to natural scientists. Some humanists, of course, have long been concerned with the issue of climate change ever since we became aware of it, but they had hitherto mostly been concerned and engaged with it in their capacity as citizens worrying about a looming catastrophe. One of the reasons why the Bish's initial intervention into this subject was so important is that it showed that climate change had enormous importance for scholars as scholars of the humanities and not simply as citizens. That, for instance, the way in which we think and write about history needs to be rethought in the light of climate change. Why so? In summary form, and I'm now bowdlerizing a more complex argument, but in summary form, because the boundary that separated the natural world from the human world and authorized thereby the distinction between the natural and the human sciences is coming undone. This is one of the meanings of the now widely used term Anthropocene. We are now living in an epoch where humankind has become, as it were, a force of nature. Historians can therefore no longer assume, as they traditionally did, that the natural world is a sort of a backdrop best left to scientists, nor that it is more or less constant and unchanging. The world, or the globe that has been the subject matter of history, is now joined by an overlapping, but also very different entity, the planet. Before proceeding to comment on some of the fruitful implications of this, I want to pause for a moment to note what I think is an important feature of De Beche's argument, and one reason why it has resonated so much. Very schematically, one could say that there are two types of invitation to think the new, to think differently. One is to say that while the object of one's inquiry has remained unchanged, our knowledge of it would be illuminated, would be improved if we approached it in the way being advocated by the author. The other is to say that the object of inquiry itself has changed and therefore we must rethink our modes of inquiring into it. The Besch's argument in this book is of the latter sort. It is in this sense, epistemologically realist. Now, I, I don't wanna open a philosophical can of worms. All I mean by this, all I mean by this is that it seeks to show that the object of inquiry has changed such that the methods of inquiry must take this into account if they are to be adequate to their object. And this is significant. It's different, for instance, from Bruno Latour's very brilliant We Have Never Been Modern, which the Besh and I both admire and have been influenced by, and which similarly argued, and one of, was one of the early important texts to argue, um, that the, the distinction between nature and culture, the human and the non-human, could not be separated. But it did so by arguing that this distinction had always been an artificial one, that we moderns invented and policed it all the time. Without taking a stand on whether this distinction was ever intellectually sustainable, the Beer shows that it is now unraveled and that this has momentous consequences for the humanities. As he puts it at one point, industrialization acted like a sort of rabbit hole in Alice in Wonderland, analogous to the rabbit hole in Alice in Wonderland, such that, I quote him now, we humans have now ourselves become a geological agent disturbing the parametric conditions needed for our own existence. This is one reason why I think the argument of this book is so compelling. It's not just an invitation to think differently, but a claim that not to do so is to fail to think intelligently. And the ambition of it also becomes clear. The claim is that the human of humanist inquiry is no longer what he or she once was, or in the Besh's own words, the human condition has changed. 
As a consequence, to continue with the Besher's argument, the human sciences now have to learn to think on at least two registers, human time and geological time, the globe and the planet, the human who endows the world with purpose and meaning, and the species, a collectivity that produces effects that were not intended or meant, and an entity, moreover, which cannot be experienced phenomenologically, and which therefore, in the Besher's words, defies historical understanding. The Besher acknowledges, in fact, he insists, because this is a crucial part of the overall argument, that there's a tension between these different registers, and that there is no synthesis that can resolve this tension. We have to live with it and think across these, what he in another place calls rifts of understanding. In fact, it's one of the defining and for me highly attractive features of this book, that it's much less concerned with providing answers than with opening up questions, a series of provocations rather than prescriptions. Of course, to write in this manner is, opens oneself up to criticism. And one of the recurring criticisms of the essays that culminate in this book has been that it lets capitalism off the hook, that climate change is an effect not of humans in general or of the species, but of capitalism and moreover of a specific subset of humans, the inhabitants of the rich countries whose wealth was quite literally fueled by fossil fuels and who therefore bear principal responsibility for climate change. The Besh makes it clear in this book that a, a call to think in two or more registers does not mean that one cancels or supersedes the other. That concerns with inequality and justice, whether in the humanities generally or with reference to climate change specifically, remain very much pertinent. But he also adds that because what it means to be human has changed, we need to be able to continue to think in this register whilst also learning to think in another, that of deep and evolutionary history and the effects of the human species on the planet. Speaking for myself, I cannot see why that should cause consternation or even be controversial. But the Besh may want to use this occasion to once again clarify the implications of his argument on this score. Okay, in the limited time available, conscious of the limited time available to me, I want to end with a question to the Besh, and one that harks back to the observation I made a few moments ago, namely that part of the power of this book lies in the argument that it is the object of thought which has changed, which is why we need to think differently. That human-made climate change should have radical implications for how we think and practice the humanities. The argument is sustained across the book, but there are moments when it seems, to me at least, as if the imperative to think differently might arise even independently of the Anthropocene. We know, for instance, that there has been freezing and warming of our planet and of other planets before, and that over a long enough time scale, it will happen again. As Debesh himself emphasizes, on two occasions, in fact, it just so happens that the current warming of the Earth is of human doing. We further know that humankind as a biological agent, now not as a geological one, has been changing the planet for millennia, and that our growing numbers and our practices of agriculture, fishing, animal husbandry, and so on, are destroying other species independently of the additional effects of human-made global warming. Thus, in principle, this is my question to the Besh, in principle, would not the sort of questions this book raises need to be asked even if we did not live in the Anthropocene? Are such questions not necessitated independently of human-made climate change by relatively new knowledges such as comparatively, comparative planetary studies and Earth system science, which do not even again, as the Besh himself informs us, have the human at the core of their inquiries. So I'll frame my question as a sort of thought experiment. I'm emboldened to do so by the fact that early in the book, the Besh draws upon another thought experiment, that of Weizmann contemplating an earth with humans no longer on it. And the question is this, suppose human-made climate change was not happening, 
but the extinction of other species and millions of years from now, global warming was happening, but not because we made it happen. Would not at least some of your arguments, Debesh, such as on the difference between the globe and the planet, for instance, still have purchase, but now independently of the claim that anchors this book, namely that it is the Anthropocene and what it shows about the changed nature of what it means to be human that compels these questions upon us. So much, Professor Said. Uh, thank you for raising these intriguing questions. Without wasting much time, I would like to move on to our next panelist, Professor Shruti Kapila. Okay, thank uh, you. Thank you, Antana, and thank you to Galplok for actually holding these series of interesting lectures. And um, I heard the page on it earlier, so this is a real pleasure. It's always lovely to see the page, and it's great to be in conversation with Sanjay uh, Said. So, um, so I haven't don't have a formal set of comments, but I reread the book this morning again, and I have, uh, as you said in your introduction, I have an uh, interest in political thought. So I will try and steer some of the discussion towards that, which is something that Dipesh also is raising in in his book. Why a kind of politics has uh, been kind of resistant to to climate change and what that, you know, what, you know, uh, in a way that Sanjay said also uh, mentions that is this, a, the object of inquiry has changed. So we need a new set of categories. But let me first say what I liked about the book, because this is quite other for me, you know, I mean, the scale, the science, it's all, you know, wonderfully uh, well written in that sense. It's a real invitation. And um, just as a kind of uh, to add to it that you actually learn a lot about geology, about uh, things like, things that you know one hadn't uh, really thought about in great detail. Secondly, I think most importantly for me, uh, what I found uh, always with the page is that it makes you think. So it's not really it, you know you always there no you know there might be answers, but you're also kind of provoked into thinking uh, new things. And in that sense, you know, this is a really wonderful philosophical history. For me, this is actually a philosophical history of the contemporary moment, uh, rather than simply also just about the Anthropocene, though, uh, of course, that is the focus of uh, the uh, work. So let me, uh, so uh, one of the things that I think in the first point will be slightly familiar to uh, the page because we have discussed it in the past in, you know, telegraphically, but uh, the book really makes uh, a one, you know, lays out not just the Anthropocene, but also the different category of world history, uh, Anthropocene, uh, as well as what the page is calling the planetary. Now, uh, I want to kind of unpack a little bit of this because it relates to the question of politics and the political. Um, so the first thing really is that, you know, I, I had arrived at this distinction between the world and the global through another uh, figure, which was Jean-Luc Nancy's work on, on, uh, on globalization, which is a very short essay. And the French language, in a way, allows for that distinction too between world making and the global. And there Nancy makes this point that uh, world, the, what we might understand by world history and the world, uh, I mean, I'm being very reductive, is something that is down to human agency. And the global is something uh, which in a way is the is a, is a form of abs, is a kind of it's an abstract category which a, which has a potential to destroy even the human. So he kind of puts a kind of tension between what he thinks is world making or world history or or even globalization versus what we might call the global as 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 a, as an abstract category which is marked by a destructive potential. And you know he is, uh, you know he is kind of following on from, in a way, someone who also appears in Depeche's work, uh, Carl Jasper's work on, 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 and therefore what might be human potential today? That is the question he is asking, you know, in late capitalism and 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 so on. So I was uh, interested in this category, and 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 when I reread this book today again, uh, I thought um, that you know Depeche kind of has something new to say here with with kind of not just because he sort of is using the planetary as a kind of disruptive category because he wants to put world history in conversation with the anthropocene but also with earth with what he's calling earth history so there are very many levels going on here which all actually speak to modernity and speak also to capitalism 
so uh, you know i mean i don't think that those are uh, those criticisms uh, work that this is not there but it's an, another way of thinking uh, uh, through that so now this poses a lot of questions for me uh, only because the word uh, the global uh, you know i buy the non c argument that you know the global is a way of thinking uh, about something in an abstract way whereas globalization or world history is something marked by human endeavor whether it is capitalism or, or not and so for me something like climate change does belong to the global you know something so abstract that you know that can uh, that has that capacity to even uh, kill us or all so the question really is then that you know and i had a, i was interested in these distinctions because uh, of my situation my own position in in history but also world history but also political thought and it seems to me that unlike capitalism uh, modern politics did not produce uh, a global language of politics uh, if i can be that bold enough so capitalism could could connect the world it could you know you had no exit clause in fact even if you were out of it you were uh, bound to be destroyed by it or affected by it or uh, in enhanced enhanced by it so there was no exit clause from uh, capitalism but at, by the same token uh, barring imperialism modern imperialism there has been no a global way of thinking about politics the closest we came to was communism and that too you know has its uh, you know problems and i don't uh, uh, want to uh, to go there so i was interested in uh, what dipesh then was trying to excavate here in in the book as well on what a politics might mean because uh, of course uh, the um, you know you have experiments in global politics like internationalism the united nations you know greenpeace you know all these things but they are marked also by a failure we know that you know whether it is afghanistan today or uh, so those those are kind of normative institutions but they are not a form of doing or thinking uh, uh, politics so i was interested how you know dipesh now uh, thinks about all this and this leads me to the second point about the political which has always been very bounded it has very much been interested in the proximate you know even if there are people we are dealing with who are foreigners others whatever politics is necessarily about the proximate rather than the abstract and the distant and uh, the, so the problem is of scale so how do you kind of think about politics in this uh, in this way and what are the answers that i think the patient is trying to give when he puts the question of science or measures in conversation or in dialogue with morality is how the category of the human itself is going through change the category so the, the what we mean by the human is is and therefore what we might be the agent might also uh, uh, might also so i want to draw a uh, uh, dipesh not so much even on the political so much but e on the category of the the human because what struck me by reading this book the second time round was that perhaps this is a uh, uh, the human in this book is a posthumous category that it's already dead the category itself is is dead and this genealogy that dipesh has offered is a posthumous category it's not a post human category which people use but it's actually that form of thinking that form of agency that form of even doing politics might be over and this is something i want to draw dipesh a little bit on because it sits unevenly in the book in a most productive way with the rumination on tagore on the rumination on jaspers a large number of other philosophers and thinkers and gandhi too you know though he doesn't really make much of a presence in the book but there is this kind of way and um in in it that you know maybe that can be drawn out here because i've always found unlike me i think the page is quite deeply humanist <laughs> i just so you know so it's a, it's a, i'm just trying to you know uh, i can i i could read the post uh, posthumous nature of humanity and i'm not meaning in a, a pessimistic sense necessarily but you know i could see that that way of thing was over so you were not drawing uh, our attention to the limited nature or the finitude of the human but as i said to the death of that category perhaps and that is the the problem that actually climate change is pushing us is not so much the political but the human and so that would be my second kind of point because i find it interesting that whether i read pankaj mishra today or even samoyan or fasel there is a way in which tolstoy gandhi tagore 
are reappearing in critiques, particularly of war and mass devastation. And in a very quiet way, these figures have re reappeared, not in their romantic incarnation, which was how we saw them, say, even 40, 30 years ago. But uh, so I was wanted to draw the page out on that uh, uh, as well. And I think the final point that I really wanted to, uh, to, to, to point to was, which is relates to politics, which relates to the human subject is uh, a very major theme of this book is temporality itself. So of course, you know, uh, not simply because it's the Anthropocene, which is a temporal category, but also how a philosophy of, of time is kind of there in, in, in the book. And I was interested in, um, uh, in this idea that while epical thinking and even historical time had given, been given a lot of uh, attention, apocalyptic time doesn't make a presence in the book. And, and to me, uh, sometimes I feel, um, uh, so, you know, just before the pandemic in Cambridge, uh, the main street was taken over by Extinction Rebellion. You know, they actually were sleeping on the street. You know, we see that in India all the time, but it was quite a novel sight in a place like Cambridge where the main artery was taken over by, uh, 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 by, and I, you know, and they were quite young people and so on. And I don't, I mean, I'm not saying what my view is about the politics, but there is a way in which catastrophic thinking and apocalyptic, apocalyptic thinking is very much part of thinking about climate change. And I was wondering why the Beish had not thought it said something about apocalypse itself, you know, given that, you know, certainly uh, even whether it's Muslim traditions or even Hindu traditions, there is a, a very rich literature and thinking around apocalyptic time. So, uh, yeah, you know, and that's why in a way uh, to kind of be not provocative, but to be kind of slightly uh, not even controversial, like that's why I feel that people who critique climate change always say, I mean, you know, they always say, their, their argument is always on the side that this is apocalyptic thinking. So either they say it's apocalyptic or they say, well, it has always been like this, right? That there has been no change in our, it's just the way we are experiencing, you know, something is different, but human, human, human geology has changed all through, you know, we've always lived through this kind of geological change. So I was wondering, you know, how the page sees immediacy in this context, you know, for political uh, intervention, but or also about how we might think about politics anew. So that was really, so thank you very much, Dipesh, for a wonderful book. And uh, also, it's always great to, as I said, you know, to think. Professor with. Kapila, I think there are lots of questions that uh, our author has to answer. So without wasting <laughs> any more time, Professor Dipesh, lead us from light to light. <laughs> I don't know that I can answer them all, but lovely to be in discussion with two people I love to talk to and agree with, disagree with have conversations with so that's that's wonderful i'm very grateful for to gulp look for arranging this opportunity and I, I i speak for about 10 minutes i think and i don't have i won't be able to answer every question but i'll go through the ones i remember and then we can come back for later um situ opportunities um so just to begin with the question of apocalypse i've just written a piece that's coming out in history and theory september issue a short piece on apocalyptic time and uh, and my resistance to it. Um, but that actually comes in the form of a response to Hartog's book on Kronos, which yes. has a discussion of Latour as an apocalyptic thinker, as a properly apocalyptic thinker, mm -hmm. but heterodox. Mm -hmm. And I kind of come into there and have some discussion of um, how Latour positions himself with regard to the apocalypse mm -hmm. and um, and how I can raise the question as to whether if one worked with a Christian or Islamic or Judaic conception mm. of the apocalypse, then it doesn't really address the question of global time. You can't, you don't know how to understand response to ordinary Chinese and Indians, mm -hmm. whatever, you know, denial, indifference, mm -hmm. uh, the deep structure that informs those responses. Uh, and and the catastrophic thinking in in Hindu tradition is different in that in that sense that you know, destruction leads to creation. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas apocalypse in the particularly Christian tradition, is that it's really end times. Mm -hmm. uh, it is at, at, at the end. So Latour has interesting things to say about it. And then I kind of comment on Hartog Latour's dialogue on the figure of the apocalypse, but which will partly answer some of your questions, but not okay. totally, because I think 
it's a short piece. But to go back to Sanjay's question, Sanjay, so even the extinction questions, what's interesting about the extinction now is that, um, and that's why it's a question of question that points to humans, is that the extinction rate for some species is sometimes thousand times above what's regarded as the background normal. So species are always going extinct. So it's like it's the rate of extinction, which is why the fear of a great extinction, a sixth great extinction happening. And if that happens, and some people say it's begun to happen because a great extinction can take, you know, it doesn't happen overnight. It can happen over a few thousand years, right? So some people say that we are in the early stages of it. And if that's true, then it will be in the first time in the history of this planet that a biological species will have caused a great extinction. Which goes back to the question of the kind of impact that we are a force of nature in that in that sense. Right? Uh, but but there are people, who, for instance, um, this guy called Thomas Nail, who is a prolific writer and has a book called Earth Theory. He's a philosopher at Denver. And he tries to argue that human beings are part of what he calls the earth. It's a kind of region of the earth. And he folds everything back into the earth. And the distinction would be that he has no interest, unlike me, in the phenomenological experience of the humans. So, you know, I, I, I say somewhere in the beginning that the climate change, even the catastrophic climate change, doesn't mean that we don't experience fear, we don't experience love, we don't experience beauty. I mean, all of those everyday experiences, we still, that apparatus belongs to us and we can experience that. And, and that's something that I was not going to put out of view, as it were, in the book. And in that sense, I would remain a humanist. From my everyday experience, that I find it very difficult to ignore the human being in front of me. So if there's a beggar in front of me, there's a happy person in front of me, if there's a person crying in front of me, I find it difficult to be, not to be moved in whatever emotions, emotional register, by that sight as a human being. Or even if a, uh, or when I'm, when I discover myself to be totally indifferent, I remain critical of my indifference. I ask myself, what made me indifferent to somebody's plight? You know, and uh, I mean, the pandemic caused it. I mean, during the pandemic, uh, I've been trying within my limits to help uh, some of the poor people in America that I personally know. And I know very few poor people in America. Whereas in India, I know lots of poor people, some of them are relatives. And, and the reason why, apart from everything else, the reason why I was doing that was because, I mean, one gives to charity and you get a tax exemption and all that in most countries, right? Now I do my little bit for charity. But actually the experience of giving to a poor person whom you know, where you kind of, in whatever way, you, you actually feel the pain. It's not the abstract poor that you give for when you give money to Oxfam or you know this or that charity. And I think that's part of my practice growing up as an Indian. So, you know, Baudelaire is that poem, Eyes of the Poor. Uh, you know I mean? so the, poor, the poor family looking into a restaurant and looking at a rich couple eating. Always reminds me of restaurants on Park Street. <laughs> and the beggars outside and the rich feasting inside. So it's very hard to grow up as an Indian person and, and, and I've never wanted to shed that aspect of myself. So in some ways, so I agree with Shruti that in, in some, some sense that, that experience of being human with regard to another human or another animal is very important to me and, 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 and I've never wanted to lose sight of that. Uh, and that kind of, He's been connected to Thompsonian histories, to subaltern histories, to histories of oppression, to Rohit Bemula's pain. It keeps me connected to all, all that. And I don't, so unlike the Thomas Nail, who wants to connect to Earth and think of humans as a region of the Earth, and the argument might be right, but but I I I don't I I, I understand understand the argument, but I, that doesn't cut me off my phenomenological liberty experience of being human. So the anger, love, hurt, you know, through which friendships are formed uh, and we continue to invest, that is very real for me.
So having said that, let me talk about a point where I'm at. Uh, listening to discussion of the book, being asked to comment on the book, being asked to write something. So it's a point that in my head goes a little bit beyond the book uh, that I want to share with you. But it's, I think it responds to some of Shruti's questions. And it also goes to some difference I have in spite of sharing a lot with Latour and Haraway and, uh, you know, Vincent Desprey and all these people who see when, I mean, first of all, do you remember that Latour developed his theory of we've never been modern or actor network theory independently of the climate crisis? I mean, the climate crisis was happening, but he was not addressing it. Nobody was addressing it in the social sciences. So when the climate crisis happened, he saw it as an affirmation of what he was saying. And, and therefore, you know, he expanded his vision. He came into this conversation. So did Donna Haraway and, and others who have been actually talking about companion species, creating a subject that is larger, larger than human, uh, kind of using Lynn Margulis's idea of uh, called homo beyond to something that kind of communities of life. You know, like you and your bacteria and your dog and your, you know, kind of because you're never alone. And and the human phenomenological experience is precisely about not being able to experience your microbiome, the bacteria on your skin, um, the bacteria in your mouth. I mean, the stuff that we uh, hate looking at, snot, has a very important bacterial role. It's sort of it's a home for certain kind of bacteria that prevents certain kind of infections. <laughs> and so the production of mucus is absolutely central to production of health. In, in an organism. But our normal human experiences, I mean, precisely you look at snot and all that stuff is horrible stuff. But <clears throat> the more I, <clears throat> I've been reading into the literature on the animals and viruses and microbes in the context of the pandemic and trying to see what happens to my argument in the book as I understood it. If I then try to extend it to understand the present situation. And two things seem clear to me. So, or the, well, two propositions. One is, of course, that <clears throat> when you think of ext extinction, what is what is the extinction of? You say extinction of life. So, use life in a very metaphysical, general category, because life. When you say extinction of life, you're talking about an extinction of a form that doesn't exist, because life exists in individual forms. Life exists as you. Life exists as me, or as a fly or as a mosquito or something. You have forms of life. But on the other end, you biologists routinely talk about continuity of life and development of multicellular life, extinction of life. So there's a peculiar problem that happens, which is which you're faced with, which is as a limited form of life, what we are <clears throat> with finite lifespans, how do we address this question of a crisis that is being located at a very abstract level of something called life, right? Which have, which actually has a very deep history, long history. I mean, why should I even relate to that? I mean, can I relate to that? And the argument in actor network theory in Donna Haraway is in partly also in new materialist philosophies like object-oriented uh, uh, anthropology and ontological stuff, right? That, uh, all that argument has been about what some what some critics call flat ontology. In other words, human ontology is not special. Uh, the ontology of a tree or a plant or a rock or whatever, you know, it's all kind of, they're all actors in a network. And the material and the non-material, the living and the non-living are connected. And, and we are like, Donna Haraway thinks we are like sort of uh, figures of, um, you know, uh, Kind of strong ornaments that finger figures, you know, that you can weave with your fingers and strings. Or that um, we are more than human because you because we have your you have your microbiome, you have your bacteria, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But when you read accounts of how people, how humans get to relate to these other forms of life, both visible and invisible. It's very clear that 
the attempt to extend human notions of relating to something, that attempt has quite serious limits. In other words, you can do it up to a point with some forms of life. And it's very hard to do with regard to a mosquito or a bacterium what you might do with regard to a dog or a chimp or a, or a chimp or baboon. So there are very interesting accounts of people who are studying baboons wanting to understand the social codes of baboons by behaving like baboons. But if virus and bacteria were human beings, then you will see that the kind of knowledge we try to have about them could be called colonial knowledge. Because a lot of it's about kind of getting rid of them, a lot of it's about managing them, a uh, lot of it's about keeping them at bay. Uh, so what happens is the kind of ethical stuff that you can talk about with regard to certain, certain animals or even bees and things, even some insects, very hard to sort of apply them to microbial entities that you cannot even see with your eyes. And so, so to give you a quick example of that, so there are certain facts about which we can do something. And there are certain facts which are facts in the history of life, but about which we can do very little, it seems to me. So take the pandemic as an example. So if you ask, what can we do with the pandemic? So basically with what medicine does, is to foreshorten the time it takes human beings to get used to a virus. So if you look at pre-modern medicine stage, like human beings were getting viruses and bacteria from animals from the time we domesticated animals. And most virologists said that it took us 5,000 years to get used to bacteria and viruses that came from animals. Now, because human beings lived in small groups, they didn't become global pandemics. But a lot of humans died. So the natural process takes thousands of years. What the Pfizer vaccine or the Moderna vaccine or the Covid shield or these AstraZeneca is trying, they're trying to do is to foreshorten that time, right? Hasten it up so that you kind of get used to the virus, strike an equilibrium with it, and it becomes sort of a uh, endemic thing. And you deal with it every year by taking a shot. Some people die, but not, not so many. Now, that is a biopolitical question. That is clearly a political question because that gives rise to debates about did Modi handle it right? Did you know Americans handle it right? Was New Zealand lockdown policy the best policy? Australian lockdown policy has now appeared to be quite stupid in the absence of uh, you know any, an inventory of vaccinations. So, but these are properly political questions. So that, and it is something we can do. It's it's a it's in that classic sense realm of freedom where we can do something. What we do is not necessarily ethical with regard to the virus, and and you do out of it, but you can stretch traditional understanding of politics to do something. But at the same time, all virologists will tell you that every method we develop to deal with a virus or a bacteria becomes a pathway of evolution for that bacterium or that virus. So the deployment of antibiotics gave rise to antibiotic resistance bacteria. Even surgical procedures give rise to new parts of evolution. And that belongs to history of life. There's nothing you can do about it. Which is why virologists say that if you were to write a thriller about this war between, you know, this sea of bacteria and viruses in which we are swimming inside us, outside us, and us. And only a minor fraction becomes hostile, right? Because most of them are friendly things doing very interesting things for your good. Uh, but if you, if you were to think about this, a biologist said you'd have to give it a title like their genes versus our wit. But it's an ongoing battle. Nobody ever says we can win this. Even the coronavirus, Anthony Fauci said that because it was living in a bat's gut, a mammalian gut, for millions of years, bats have been around for 50 million years. He says that it's kind of, and then it's gone through other animals, mammals. So it said a, a virus in the gut of a mammal is pre-adapted 
for the human cell because our cells are mammalian cells. Okay. Now, this fact that whatever we do will become a new pathway of evolution, that our bodies have become a pathway of evolution for the virus. I mean, the Delta variant wouldn't have come about if they were not interacting with our cells and our immune systems. That is a fact about which we can do very little, but it's a fact. And so I kind of, today I wonder whether my point about reverence that I talked about, you know, one of my reverence and Jasper's epochal consciousness, whatever, is not an argument actually for the, for the, both the, the absolute necessity of the political to do something and its provincially and parochially human nature. In other words, to look on the provincial both as absolutely necessary and as provincially parochially human. And to use that political to delimit the domain of the human, to scale it back. So if the destruction of forests are causing zoonotic illnesses, it is the task of the political to stop the destruction of forests. So in some ways, I think my argument beyond the book, as I think through the book and faced with all of these questions, is actually returning me to the political and its importance. But also to realize that the so-called universals of the political that we think of as universals are probably in Hegelian terms, false universals. I mean, a biological species is a much more of a universal, a scientific universal, but you can't ground any politics in it. Because as, as Sartre says, uh, in his, I mean, it's a Hegelian point, but Sartre makes it beautifully in the introduction to Fanon's Wretched of the Earth, where he says, look, it's only by recogni recognizing that another human being is a human being that you enslave him or her, that you humiliate them, as in the caste system, that you torture them in a way you wouldn't torture an animal. And the whole master-slave dialectic, I mean, this is the kind of point of recognition, really, that Hegel is making, right? But so, so in some ways, it seems to me what I, so in many ways, Latour's point, we have never been modern, is taken in the sense that, but I take it as a more historical, a historicizable point, that at a certain, it's really a function of urbanization. And we have become increasingly urban in the 20th century, 21st century. The more urban we become, the less we are in contact with other species. And but and and, the, and, the, and it's a very funny, ironical problem that's happening. American cities have been historically described in comparison with third world cities as so clean, I mean, Western cities, as to be bad for human beings. Not enough bacteria. You know, the man who produced the literature on human need for eating fiber, you know, like now if you buy your cereal, it says five dietary fiber was an Irish missionary who was working in Uganda in the 1970s, who noticed that that the Ugandan person's uh, shit was five times heavier than the average American person's feces. But it passed twice as easily through their guts. And he said, okay, that's because they eat a lot of fibers. I mean, it's actually fibers plus bacteria now, people realize, not just fibers. So, it's this argument that almost we are Talwar Oldenburg's argument that cities have to be clean, cities have to be, you know, drained out of uh, all bacterial presence, et cetera, et cetera. So in fact, a Western person's gut typically has fewer bacteria than uh, an Indian person's gut. And normally they would think of the Indian person's gut as actually richer and, and more like what humans should be like. So at some point in human history, and I think that has to go to get a great acceleration thesis, the world, world history, the global history, et cetera. This has been, I mean, the argument, the nature culture separation has been intensified. It would not be as true of 19th century Ufasil towns. It was, it, I mean, as I say in the book, it was not as true of the rural part of Calcutta in which the first 10, 12, 13 years of my life um, were spent. I mean, I've seen even visible species getting lost as the city got more urbanized.
So in so in some respects, I I think what's doable belongs to the realm of politics. What's something that we can't do anything about belongs to the realm of recognition, cognition. We have to be aware of it. And in that sense, probably return back to the question of the finitude of the human, the, the limited nature of being human. That's where I've kind of arrived at. Uh, but maybe you guys have something to say to this. Because I, that's what I was trying to get at when I mentioned Tolstoy, Gandhi, and um, Jaspers for you, you know, this politics of restraint that they wrote about. It wasn't just anti-modernity, uh, which is how it has been received, or, or anti-industrialization, but a kind of very active politics of restraint, which is what I think ties you up with other thinkers who are thinking much more about war and violence rather than... Uh, uh, but I was interested in the pandemic question and the politics question and the doability question, what is doable and what is not. And I had a slightly different experience of the pandemic from you, not in the sense of uh, a slightly different take in the sense, but it spoke to what you have said that you are very human in terms of you feel people and you know all of th that you started with. And that sort of brought to the point that yes, you know, politics and the human are bounded in intimacy, and 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 that, and you know, those are the only. So there might be scales which we cannot do nothing about. Uh, but you know, there is the kind of intimate horizon in which and proximate horizon in which certain things can be done. And that's why I found the pandemic particularly pernicious because it actually uh, forced us to our individuated uh, intimacies. Uh, because it's literally asking us not to connect, not to be with others. Uh, and, and this actually, I think the pandemic that way is not simply about whether one government got it right or wrong. To me, it feels a bit more apocalyptic, if I can use that word, because it is asking us to become um, into the politics of self-care, you know, the, the, which sort of Foucault ends up with, that the only thing you can do is have responsibility for yourself. And, you know, you, you know. so I, so the pandemic in that sense, to me, made me question uh, intimacy a lot more and make it a much more questionable category, uh, uh, you know, because it, uh, it, um, I mean, it's there in my book too that intimacy is actually quite a can be quite a violent. It's a condition of violence too. But uh, I I thought, especially in terms of the 19th century or earlier forms of say modern classically modern forms of politics, were based on some anonymity that you connected with people you did not know, uh, you know, in 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 a direct way. And um, just wanted to. So yeah, so that was really the question was that you know uh, what you described so evocatively and correctly that we have emotions, we have sensory experiences, we have investments on that basis with with friends, neighbors, and others. Um, when it becomes, as it were, the essential condition of living in a pandemic, that you know you are brought onto yourself and onto the familiar, and and you're disallowed to to actually do the anonymous public. Uh, collective uh, thinking, like, you know, for instance, you know, whether it was the Extinction Rebellion on the street downstairs or whether it was the CAA protests in Delhi, those are the things which overnight got picked up, you know, uh, torn apart, you know. Uh, and uh, so I'm just curious that, you know, the scales, can I quickly, yeah, can yeah, I? Yeah, so I was just on, this is one my only point. With sure, yeah, no, actually, no, no. and that is why the human is, in fact, the correct opposite to the planetary, the global, the abstract. So in that sense, you know, I don't have a problem with that dyad, but yeah, it's the no, intimacy that scares me. The only thing I want to say is that actually the scale is not necessarily humongous. I mean, when the bacteria is evolving in response, let's say, to an inject to a vaccination or, or an instrument, whatever, it's happening on a very small scale. It's not like it's happening on a geological scale. It's happening, the evolution thing is, you know, because bacteria and viruses have short life lifespans, the evolution is much quicker. Because evolution is intergenerational, mm -hmm. but they have many more generations to go through, even in our lives. So actually, so you can. That's why you said there's now a new variant, a Delta variant that's become etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So it kind of reproduces itself and produces more variants of itself. So this, so it's not as such. I'm, I'm simply saying that that the human. Uh, capacity for collective action. I'm totally with you. I think the pandemic needs for the mobilization. Uh, the the kind of politics I'm looking for needs pressure 
to be put on powerful people. I mean, only today I read that in West Bengal proudly is going to have the world's biggest coal mine. You know, they've been without jobs, they're so, so desperate for jobs that they're going to start dirty industries of the world in West Bengal. Um, <laughs> very sad reading it. But uh, so, so precisely, I mean, the, the, the Zoom mobilizations won't do it. I mean, in the end, there has to be mobilization. I, no, I agree with that. But I was simply saying that it's a. Uh, um, so thinking beyond the book, I've, at least the way I'm thinking now, I'm kind of have to realize even more how, what a limited entity the human is, <laughs> both in terms of what it can do and it can't always act on what it knows. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it can be concerned about what it knows, but doesn't mean that it can act on sure. those things effectively. And uh, so maybe and and politics was a way of kind of thinking about that at the moment. So um, we are not going to sort all this out. But no, Sanjay, no. Sanjay. But can I respond to that point? What you were saying earlier about politics? It it struck me as you were elaborating on what you've thought since the book that you know politics as we understand it, which is born of the French and American Revolution. So we're not talking dynastic politics. We're talking about sovereignty, the people, etc. You know, it, it was imbued with a deeply Promethean spirit, the idea that you, you, you can remake the world. And, and, you know, one of the oddities of global climate change is that we have remade the world, but not, not in the way that Prometheus imagined it, as an act of will, consciously enacted and so on. It's, it's disastrous and it's unintended. And maybe one big takeaway from this that's very much implicit in your book is the limits of that Promethean spirit, um, which, which sure. is not an argument against politics, but it links up with what you were saying about all that lies beyond right. politics. No, I totally agree. The only, only qualification I'd make, Sanjay, is that there's one very ancient strand of human civilization, or human settlement even, that remains in political thought of the 17th century, which is the idea that a human settlement is about protecting human life. Mm -hmm. And that is an idea very old. So right from the you know invention of fire, from cave dwelling, and I mm -hmm. discuss this in the book through Heidegger, that the very notion of dwelling has always kind of carried connotations of security. And, and the irony of this civilization is that it is in search of security mm, that we've created that we've created insecurities for life so mm. it is precisely by ex extending the sphere of biopolitics you know to include plants to include destroy forests to get mm. biofuel to create farmland to mine it is in, it's a huge expansion of biopolitics the aim of which was to securitize mm. human life has ended up making human life insecure. <laughs> and, the, mm -hmm. and the pandemic is a very clear demonstration of that. And the second thing that has happened, another undoing, which is more modern, a 19th century thing has come undone, which is 19th century expanded this gap between natural history and human history. And Collingwood and people were saying humans are not things, things are chronology, right? Because this mm -hmm. Australian philosopher, uh, Samuel Alexander, wrote a book in 1936 in a an article in a book that was published in honor of Kessler. And the, the article was called The Historicity of Things. That's 1936, huh? Think Theory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Collingwood was furious with this article. So his idea of history was written mainly against Samuel Alexander, but Alexander, this Australian guy, was also influenced by American philosopher Whitehead, uh -huh. Book of Nature, right? Mm -hmm. And this, so this argument that human beings are not a thing, has now come undone because geologically we act like like we were huge asteroids tracking the earth. Mm -hmm. So we have there been a kind of thingification, not at the level of reification that Marx used to talk about. Mm -hmm. But at, but at a geological level, there'd be a kind of thingification of, of humans. So two modern two precepts of kind of modernity. One actually, I think, is a very ancient precept that human life Human settlement communities about protecting human life from wild animals, from you know all kinds of danger, including other humans. Mm 
and that humans are not like things, these two things have come undone. And uh, I'm saying we need to, we don't need to get back to the second proposition, but we need to get back to the first proposition, how to securitize human life. And that would mean going to questions of restraint, scaling back, whatever image you, you know, whatever is the image you use to convey that idea. And there needs to be a politics of that. There needs to be a politics that aims at that. So I come back to politics uh, as part, both part of the limitedness of human beings, but also as something we have ultimately at the end of the day for, for interventions. So that's why I have a phrase in the book where, where I talk about being political at the limits of the political. Uh, okay, then thank you so much. Uh, I would like to thank the author, uh, our very engaging panelists who have raised such interesting questions. I'm pretty sure the audience would look forward to read the book if you people haven't yet. And I will meet you people in the next episode. Thank you so much. <laughs>